Yeah, so the biggest trade show in our industry just isn't happening anymore. But other than that, did anything really happen this week? Hey guys, it's Hunter. Welcome back to this week's episode of Ask a Fish. Hope you guys are all doing well. And if everything's gone according to plan, we're hanging out on a Sunday. And if not, I've failed with the weekly schedule a weekend. Regardless, you guys had questions. Remember to join our Discord server. That's the best way to get your questions answered every week. Plus, it's a really cool community. And if you go into enjoy the video, leave a sacrificial like at the altar, maybe a comment, subscribe if you're new, hit notifications that we don't miss any uploads from me. All that stuff actually really helps out the channel. Let's appease the algorithm gods together. And with that, let's jump into your questions. Foreskin Gamer Extreme, <laughs> good to see you again, says, thoughts on the new Alexi ESP line? I love them. Not just the models themselves, like I'm a huge fan of LTD and ESP. Those f***ing railroad track frets and the neck shapes are so comfortable. But also like how they've been introduced and what they represent. These were the last guitar ideas that Alexi Leho, a guitar legend, that inspired a lot of us back in the day, gifted to the world. So if you're not familiar with him, Alexi Leho, founder of Children of Bodom and Bodom After Midnight, he sadly passed away last year. He's been an ESP artist forever since about 2002, I believe. And he had some of the most recognizable signature models. I generally can't stand pointy guitars, but man, did I want a pink sawtooth and still do if I'm honest. So the five new Alexi models are separated into the Hexed and the Ripped series. They're the first new Leo signature models in over seven years, if you can believe that. Got that modified Jackson Road shape with the longer bottom horn. I think only the Edwards version sold exclusively in Japan still have the proper Jackson shape. The most important thing I think we can all agree on is that they're all purple. Dear guitar companies, more purple guitars, yes please. You got an ESP hex made at the Japan Custom Shop for $55.99, an LTD production version for $15.49. These come with a single EMG HZ H2 in the bridge, which is a passive pickup that's supposed to be one of their more vintage-y sounding ones. And then you got an ESP ripped for a whopping $57. 99 an e2 japanese production line version for 24.99 and finally an ltd version for 15.99 the biggest difference between these and the hex besides the satin finish instead of gloss and the ripped pinstripes is that they've got an additional emg hcs2 single coil in the neck position other than that the models share a lot of the same specs on paper alder body ebony fingerboard three-piece maple thin u neck through construction doesn't look like stainless steel on any of the models despite ltd moving to stainless steel on all the 1000 series base models frets 19 to 24 are scalloped though which i loved on the kh3 spider you barely have to press down to fret a note and i said in that video i hoped we'd start seeing more scallops on import production models. That's huge. And right now I think only LTD is doing it, but the more that they do it, the more that they push other brands to start doing the same thing. Obviously the more expensive models, besides being presumably better quality, are also a little better spec. The ESPs and the E2 come with Floyd Rose original trims, while the LTDs get Korean Floyd Rose 1000s. And while the LTDs have non locking Grovers, the ones made in Japan have Godo locking tuners. There's nothing wrong with Grover and Floyd 1000s, those probably fall into the best bang for buck category when it comes to hardware. Obviously though, when you get to E2 and above, you start getting the real premium level stuff. The Japan made ones also have an ESP MMO4 active boost switch, giving you an extra 18 decibels to play with if you need them, and a preamp circuit with adjustable EQ settings, both of which are missing on the LTDs. Focusing on the LTDs though, for a minute, since that's the level that I normally like to focus to on the channel, given their relative attainability, I do have to say, I think the price is a little high. Even given production difficulties and supply chain shortages, the previous Alexi 600 had the same specs as these new LTDs, and last time I checked at least, it was like $12.99 new. And even shipping containers are so stupidly expensive compared to what they normally are. So I get it, producing guitars and getting them to customers is significantly more expensive than it ever has been. But also, like, especially given no upgrades, no boost, no stainless steel frets, $15.49 and $15.99, that's not exactly a small price increase. And I'm not normally into pointy guitars at all, but I do have a soft spot for Alexi Leo. It's been a long time since I've listened to any melodic deathcore, but Bodum was one of the bands that really got me into metal back in the day, and Alexi was such an inspiration to so many people and an absolute shred god. And I think these guitars are such a great tribute to the man's legacy. Like, even though they've been released posthumously, he did design them. So they're kind of like his last parting gift to us. So those are just my thoughts on the new Alexi Hexed and Rip series, but what do you think? Do they look dope? Do they look meh? Let me know down in the comments. 
I get it, but we want to know which guitars you hate too. I'll be honest, generally don't waste my time on guitars I hate because time is valuable. You don't get that back. But, uh, let's see. I guess the Firebird Zero definitely comes to mind. It's been four years and I still fucking hate that guitar. It's supposed to be a US made Gibson, all import parts, flawed bridge, cash grab. What a piece of shit. Down to the marketing, snot color marketed as gold mist. Disgusting. Shameful. Did a high integrity video on that though and it came out pretty good after 500 bucks worth of upgrades. The Wish.com guitar I bought for 30 bucks. That's pretty garbage. It's currently disassembled because I was gonna do some sort of upgrade thing with it but I kind of also really don't want to because I fucking hate it. Uh, off camera over there is a glary guitar. I think they called it the Burning Fire. They should have called it Steaming Pile. They sent it over, they wanted to pay for a video feature, and as soon as I took it out of the box, I was like, yeah, this guitar sucks. I don't want to spend any time on it, no thank you. you know, any video that I made on it was not the video that they were gonna want to see. I've never seen a fingerboard that dry it was like they excavated the thing from king tut's tomb and i've got really strong spec preferences that i try to emphasize in videos it's like a baseline as to why i bond with some guitars over others because feels a very difficult thing to translate through the internet without actually having you play it yourself so the idea is hopefully by emphasizing what i like you get a better idea as to whether or not you'll like the feel of that guitar too like i can't stand super thin necks with flat fingerboards and i'm not a fan of pointy ass weapons either, but I don't hate them. They're just not for me. I think it's very bizarre, and you see this a lot in the comments when people go and just sh on something that a lot of other people love just because they don't like it. Not because there's anything objectively wrong with that neck profile or anything, just subjectively, it's not for them. I don't know, it's like the equivalent of someone walking into a party where no one knows them, and they just take a sh on the carpet before walking out, and it's just like, why? No one thinks you're cooler for doing that. And definitely no one wants to talk to you either, except maybe the authorities. I don't know, I've just noticed a lot of toxicity lately, and it's just, I don't know, it's kind of a bummer. Before we get into the next question, I want to give a massive shout out to Mark Sinclair and the rest of the amazing patrons that support the channel and make all these videos possible. All the Patreon money goes to Luke for the mixes or to Jordan for editing videos, so it's really appreciated. And if you want to support the channel as well, get bonus stuff like MP3s and tabs to all the demo tracks. The link is in the cards. But yeah, I just like to do a little patron shout out every video because literally without them, uh, none of this would be possible. And uh, with that, into the next question. Name is cancelled. Thoughts? Yeah, okay, so personally, talk about another bummer. But I'm also not really sure it matters. Like, does Nam even matter anymore? Let's talk about that in a second. But first, basically, what's up is that Winter Nam, the huge show that's happened for decades at the beginning of the year, is not happening this January. Like, in any fashion. In 2021, we had, like, a digital-only event. It's just not happening in January this year. We'll see what happens after 2022, but for next year, they're moving it to June, which is when Summer Nam, the smaller show in Nashville, normally happens. So it's like they're combining the two trade shows into one and moving it to Anaheim. So here's what I think. Personally, I love Nam, seeing all the new guitars and stuff. That's obviously really cool. But Winter Nam, Summer Nam, I missed it this year because it's like the closest thing that I have to like a coworker happy hour. Very long, weekend long, binge happy hour. Just hanging out, playing guitars, having drinks with other YouTubers, with people from brands I normally only email. Like, I haven't had a beer with Patrick Hunter in so long, it's crazy. So that's just from my highly specific perspective. But from a more general perspective, I think it's pretty indicative that when the news broke, I barely saw any comments about it. Barely any videos about it for that matter either. Like, the news was just met with this resounding meh from manufacturers, from retailers, from you guys, the YouTube guitar community. It's just like, nobody really cared. And I think there still is something to be gained by having this big centralized hype event, like a big gear celebration that gets all us gear nerds talking and analyzing the trends for the coming year and having all these creative and business minds interact in person. I think all that is really valuable for the industry. But I think this year showed in-person trade shows just aren't as important as they used to be and it's now a debate whether we actually need them at all in any form. And at the very least we certainly don't need two NAMs. Although I will say Summer NAM is a lot of fun because it is so much smaller. It's like cute NAM and Nashville barbecue is really good. As a YouTuber it's easier to talk to people but from a business perspective like manufacturers and dealers they don't really need it because 
We have the internet. We have company live streams and YouTubers keeping us up to date with all the latest unveilings, all the new product releases. We have official demos that go up day of reveal. We have launch day integrations with content creators. It's cheaper than a trade show and it generates hype amongst the right people. You heard this a lot from people in the gear industry. NAM was becoming less of a trade show for manufacturers and dealers to conduct business and more about the spectacle and the hype a lot of which can be translated online. And we have staggered releases throughout the year. It's not like everything gets announced at one time anymore. And not just NAM, but trade shows in general aren't as important anymore. You see it in other industries too. Take E3, for example. That's the video game equivalent of NAM. And it's still a big cultural event, but credit to Nintendo, they started doing Nintendo Direct live streams before everyone else, directly connecting with their fans and it was a big hit. Other companies started doing the same thing. And Nintendo still has a presence at E3, but once they started doing the direct live streams, the show no longer had a monopoly on their target audience's attention. Fast forward to 2021, product information, video content, consumer analytics, all of it is so accessible now. And there's an established culture, even if there's no NAM, around NAM time, us guitarists know to look for announcements. So you'll have brands doing alternate digital events. ESP Presents 2021 was an example this year. So we'll see what happens. I don't think that NAM moving from winter to summer is a bad idea this year, especially given the probable spike we'll see once the weather starts getting colder. I mean, you've got a bunch of dealers and manufacturers coming from abroad. You don't want a situation where a lot of them can't come. Again, a big part of modern day NAM is it's almost like a celebration of all this different gear and a bunch of people from around the world that share a passion. And you don't want to limit that. So summer's a good call. Anyways, the point that I've been taking my time to get to is I've seen people frame this as, oh, NAM is dead because they've canceled Winter NAM. They haven't canceled the main event, they've just moved the dates. And that in itself, I don't think is a sign that NAM is in trouble. I think the sign that NAM is in trouble is the almost complete apathy from the community. No one seems to really give a f And I gotta say, I feel you. This summer NAM had so little hype, it was unreal. PV had the saddest excuse for a booth I've ever seen. They did not give one and hey, I get it. I've definitely turned in school projects where I didn't give a f either and it kind of looked like that But here's the thing. It's hard for people to care when even the high-profile participants Aren't even trying to give them a reason to and listen. There's a lot of romanticism around the event There's a lot of things that suck about NAM too. It's expensive to travel and to stay in Anaheim for the weekend There's too many people especially as an introvert you are exhausted by the end of the last day and all those hands touching the same guitars like Nam Thrax after the show that can get you good but man when you can't go you miss it and for all the things that suck about the show it would suck a lot more if it disappeared for good not just because it's fun but also those eyeballs help smaller brands get noticed that's really the biggest losers here the small boutique brands the new startups being part of an event that attracts that much mainstream attention can be a game-changing opportunity. It's also super expensive, and apparently there are a bunch of extortionate tactics at play though. So if they're creative, maybe they'll find better ways to use that money. But anyway, so I'm just starting to ramble now, but those are all the thoughts that are coming into my head about NAM being moved and combined and what that might mean for the future. But let me know what you think. Do you care? Does this matter at all in your opinion? Or no, do you think the future is all digital content, direct communication, influencer marketing, that kind of thing? Really curious, any and all thoughts, leave them down below. Speaking of influencer marketing though, in a very literal segue. Let's take a quick second to thank today's sponsor, Ridge Wallet. Now you guys have definitely heard me talk about Ridge Wallet before, but just in case this is your first time on YouTube or something, so Ridge is redefining the wallet. And why are they doing that? Well, traditional wallets kind of really suck. You know it's true, they're bulky, they tend to collect all this useless crap. That's just the way they are. So Ridge have decided to do things differently with this little thing. Super compact design, durable plates made of titanium, aluminum, or carbon fiber. I've been using the Forge Carbon design. It looks super cool, but if that's not your thing, they've got a variety of designs to match your personality. Plates are RFID blocking to thwart would-be scammers from stealing your card information. I love mine. I love being freed from carrying around all this useless crap. And if you want to see why so many people are switching over to the Ridge wallet, head on over to ridge.com slash agfish. And if you use the code agfish, they're giving you guys 10% off your order. Hugely thankful for their support in bringing you content. And they're also running an awesome limited time giveaway. With every dollar spent on the website before September 18th, you'll be entered to win an off-road optimized convertible 2020 Jeep Gladiator. Or if you're like me and prefer cash money, there's also $50,000 up for grabs. So yeah, check them out. Free shipping and returns, lifetime guarantee, code Agafish for 10% off your order. And with that, let's jump to the next question. 
<laughs> Dead asks, Ernie Ball or Clear Tone? Oh, all right, let's have the string conversation. Clear Tone, always Clear Tone. They've been a huge supporter of the channel. I'd have to go with them. They sent me a big box of strings like two years ago and I'm still working my way through it. Literally just don't have to change my strings that often because they're treated and they don't corrode. And they feel like normal strings to me, so that's why I like them. But to be honest, strings don't make a huge difference to me, like I could play anything. As long as they're 9 to 42s, the quality feels decent and they last a long time, that's good enough for me. Actually, wait, I take that back. I've just tried Diderio Pro Steels, I think that's what they're called, and those are pretty cool. Instead of nickel wounds, they're made of stainless steel, so you get that extra bright snappiness and smooth bends that you normally get with stainless steel frets. Those Pro Steels, they were the first strings in a long time where it was like, okay, there's actually a pretty noticeable difference and it's a good difference. I've got that on my 72 Restamod right now, so with Pro Steels and stainless steel frets, it's a super bright sounding guitar and bands are buttery as f But I know that's not like a common thing for guitarists where like strings don't matter too much. A lot of my guitar playing friends have very strong preferences when it comes to strings. So what's your favorite? Or are you like me, where you just like when they feel nice and last long? Bit of a, bit of a sentence there, we move. Emily asks, how often do you restring and maintain your main guitars? See previous answer about restringing, it's it's not often. I've been rotating a lot these days. Like, what's the point of having a bunch of cool guitars if you don't play them? One day I'll be on the Navigator, another the 74 Norlin. The Tremonti gets a lot of playing time these days, still need to make a video on that. I've been playing the Ernie Ball a lot, and the kind of super aged white one back there is the newest cool toy. I've already filmed the unboxing video for it, so you'll see what it is in about a week maybe? Subscribe if you're curious. But yeah, I used to set all my guitars up twice a year. Like winter, summer, Georgia, our winters are cold and dry as shit. And then summer, it's hot and humid as f As you can imagine, that huge swing doesn't play too nicely with guitar necks that are made of wood. But because I rotate so often, and this is gonna sound really bad. I feel like with an audience, I'm supposed to be a good influence, but I kind of only do maintenance when they need it. And that really varies from instrument to instrument. Like my signature, that roasted maple neck is incredible. I've had that prototype for two years and I barely needed to touch it. It's so stable. And then the Hello Kitty Evertune, like obviously that never goes out of tune, but it's still got the original Squire frets and the ends, they like to sprout. So once every nine-ish months, I'll file the ends down. It's not the best solution, but it works for now. Eventually, there will be a Nostalgia Fish replacing the frets with stainless steel because it's gonna need it. I love that guitar. The frets are just a massive weak spot. So yeah, usually only maintenance where it's painfully obvious. Like I'll pick a guitar up after a while and it's like, wow, this fretboard needs hydrating. But yeah, really bad. To prolong the life of your instrument, it's like your car or your body. Take care of it and it'll take care of you. And I haven't been doing that. Don't be like me. And it's been a while, but we've got some new entertaining idiots in the comments. So now it is time to hear from yet another adoring fan. It's the high praise of the week. Quote, I modified a vintage and I instantly didn't like you not watching, just dropping in to leave this shitty comment. Right, but did you look at the state of the guitar before it was modified? So you're telling me you would play it like this? Alright then, you fucking idiot. So that'll do it for this week's episode of Ask Fish. I hope you enjoyed hanging out with me as much as I enjoy hanging out with you. Just talking guitar gear, man. It's just, it's kind of what I started the channel for. So it's cool that we get to do it every week. Thanks again to Ridge Wallet for sponsoring the video and to the amazing patrons for supporting the channel. Social media, merch, and Discord server links are in the description. As always, thank you so much for watching. You've been awesome and I'll see you for the next video, which will be on a Wednesday. Manifest that energy. It'll happen. I'll see you then.